morning. Welcome to worship, those of you who are seated in front of me, and those of you who are on camera somewhere, and internet, and etc. Um, Pastor Travis and his family are away today. Uh, they're on a couple of vacation days visiting family, which is great. And Travis asked me, Jack Seymour, a uh, member of the congregation, ordained United Methodist clergy, if I would lead today. So I'm trying, and I need your help. So pray for me as we move ahead. Uh, friends, today is a complicated Sunday in the United Methodist Church. It's the second Sunday after Epiphany. That's number one. You'll see that in your bulletin. Number two, it's designated as Human Rights Sunday by the United Methodist Church. And so today is Human Rights Sunday. And then tomorrow is the U.S. holiday for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. All of those will try to weave in the service this morning. We'll see if that happens, okay? Pray for me, okay? Thank you. Good morning. Good, morning. Good cold morning. <clears throat> Please join with me in the call to worship. The voice of God calls to us. Are you listening? The hands of God beckon us. Are you paying attention? The love of God asks us, are you ready to follow? Come, let us worship the God whose tenacious love never stops calling and beckoning and asking us to follow. I invite you to stand and sing hymn number 519. Lift every voice and sing.
Please pray with me. When we confess our sins, we accept God's invitation to clear out the noise and chaos that keeps us from recognizing God's loving voice. So as we come to confess our sins and we reconcile to God and one another, take this opportunity to let God help you declutter your heart and your mind so that you might listen and receive God's love and guidance more clearly. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you as our God, nor have we loved our neighbors as ourselves, or our priorities do not line up with yours. And too often we wander from your path by trying to do things our way instead of yours. Forgive, Forgive us, Lord. Lord. Your servants repent. Merciful God, we confess that we are too often complacent in answering your call to exact justice, to enact justice. We call, you call us to enter the flow of your justice that rolls down like water, and instead we inhibit the work of the justice by choosing not to pay attention or believe the stories of suffering and the need in our midst. Forgive, Forgive us, Lord, your, your servants, servants repent. repent. Merciful God, we confess that sometimes we avoid you. We don't want to hear your voice. We don't want to receive your call. We are scared of what you might ask us to do and how letting your grace work in our lives might change us. So we keep you at arm's length, ready to run when you seem to ask us too much of us. Forgive, Forgive us, us Lord. Lord. Your Lord. Your Lord. Your Lord. Merciful God, we confess that there are things that clutter our hearts and minds and that we cannot say aloud or do not have words for. And so we lift them to you now in silence. Let us offer our silent prayers at this time, reconciling God, your steadfast love surrounds us, calling us into right relationship with you, with self, with one another, and with creation. As your reconciled and forgiven people, open our hearts to receive all that you have to say to us today. Speak, Speak Lord, Lord, your, your servants, servants are listening. <laughs> Loving God, you call us by name to be your people in the world pouring your love into us in such abundance that it overflows into the world around us. Guide us, form us, and send us as your people to live out our good news wherever we go. Call, Call us, Lord. Lord. Your servants will follow. Amen. Amen. Friends, as we get ready to read the scripture, will you join me in the prayer of illumination? Lord, open our hearts and minds 
by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scripture is read and your word proclaimed, may we hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. And now any of you that are able, please stand so that we can hear the gospel reading and honor the gospel. <clears throat> it's a story from the gospel of John. Jesus calls Philip to be a disciple. And Nathaniel, who's studying, then also is convinced. It's a strange story, but let's listen. The next day, Jesus wanted to go into Galilee. And he found Philip. Jesus said to him, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip then found Nathanael and said to him, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law and the prophets, Jesus, Joseph's son from Nazareth. And Nathanael responded, you've heard this before, can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip said, well, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, here comes a genuine Israelite in whom there's no deceit. And Nathanael said, how do you know me? Jesus answered, before Philip called you, I saw you under a fig tree. By the way, that means I saw you studying. That's all it means. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you're God's son. You're king of Israel. And Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. I assure you that you will see heaven open and God's angels going up to heaven and down to earth to see me, the human one. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's time for the children to come forward for the children's message. And Joe Cottingham is going to be leading us. He's one. enthusiastic. Good morning. That's much better, I think. Well, I'm glad all three of you are here. We're going to have a good church service today, and we need to tell the parents that during the service, we're not going to have the children go out to their wonders of worship time. We're all going to stay in here. Pastor Jack is what I call him because he's a, a pastor, but he likes for us to call him Jack, is going to bring us a special message today. And it's about some things that we all need to hear about. So we'll stay in here today. And most Sundays, we offer the chance for the parents who want their children to be able to go to do crafts and hear stories uh, to do that. And of course, the option is always there that your children stay here with you in the service. But I'm glad you all are here today. One of the things that's special about this weekend is tomorrow is a holiday, so you won't be in school. What is the holiday tomorrow? Martin Luther King Day. That's right. Did you know that? I think part of our message that we're going to hear today is about Dr. Martin Luther King, and I wanted to ask you about something that he said that I thought was really special that people remember, and he's, he's been gone a long time from this earth, but he was still here when I was growing up and when I was grown. And he did a lot of things to make some really good changes. But he made a speech one 
time, and people call it the I have a dream speech because he, I think 16 times, I think I read that during the speech, he said, I have a dream, and he talked about different dreams. Not the kind of dream where you lie down and go to sleep and dream about fairy dust and and how handsome your grand Joe is or whatever. You just these these are dreams that you have for the future. Do you have a handsome pa papa? I better ask somebody else. Are you listening? Do you have a handsome papa? Your, your arm made your head do this, so I couldn't hear your answer. But I think they both said yes. I know I'm not going to ask you because you might be a copycat today. Anyway, handsome is not really what matters because it's whatever somebody is like inside that matters, isn't it? That makes us all attractive. And Dr. King said, I have a dream that, and this is close to what he said, this is what it meant exactly, that someday my four children, he had four children, will grow up in a world where what will matter to other people is not what you look like or what you sound like, not what you do for a living, but what you're like inside and how you treat other people. He said the content of your character is important. Is, is that a good dream for somebody to have for his children to grow up that way? Tell me about some dream you have. What do you think about you would like to happen someday? Being with your friends and your family, is that what you said? That's a pretty good dream. And you get to live that dream, don't you? Because you have a lot of family and a lot of friends. The same as her. Say that again. The same as her. All right. Well, you, I'm glad I didn't ask you the other question a while ago when you say the same as her. What, what's your dream? What's one of the things you hope happens? Um, I, I, like, I like being with my friends. Well, that's something that you get to dream about and, and do every day, isn't it? Do you have a lot of friends? Mm -hmm. Are your friends good people? Mm -hmm. I'll bet the content of their character is good. And that's what we all want to try for, is to be good people and to respect other people. Thank you very much for joining me today. Do you want to say a prayer together? Will you repeat if I say a prayer? Let's close our eyes. God, thank you for the chance to dream and think about what we want to happen in the future. And now you can repeat, thank you, God, for all that you give us, for giving us dreams, and the chance to live those dreams. Amen. Thank you, Joe. This is not in your, in your bulletin, but it is on the screen. We're going to sing a hymn of preparation, hymn number 582. It's called, Whom Shall I Send? And we'll sing stanzas one, three, and four.
Let's pray. Holy God, guide us all. Guide me as we share in the meanings of today. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, this Sunday has several emphases. Let me remind you. We're celebrating the second Sunday after Epiphany, and there's another few of them until Easter season, or Lent, I'm sorry, Lent comes before Easter. Second, today is designated Human Relations Sunday by the United Methodist Church, and as Joe and the children said, tomorrow is the Martin Luther, Luther King Jr. holiday. And more than all of that, we've just heard this weird call story about Jesus saying, Philip, follow me, and all of a sudden it happens. Poof. Dramatic. Well, I have to admit to you, I'm a little conflicted this morning about my ability to put all of these themes together. And if you help me, I think we'll try. We'll see at the end whether it happens. The season of Epiphany is about call. In the next few weeks, if I can say it this way, you're going to get a lot of calls about your call. And while I believe we get calls from God, I don't think most of them come as dramatically or quickly as Phillips did. Do you? Second, we're to remind ourselves today about the work of justice. Today, we focus on the dramatic impact and transformation that Joe told the children about that Dr. King made. And here in Nashville, human rights leaders like John Lewis and Diane Nash did. Yet, these dramatic stories come exactly when it's cold outside. The weather's threatening to shut us down with a snowstorm tonight. Glad you made it out before that. And we're back at our post-Christmas ordinary times of school schedules, work responsibilities, and for some of us, medical appointments. <laughs> yes, <laughs> conflicted is a good word, isn't it? I guess I have a bit of the post-Christmas blues. Do you? Particularly with the snow coming. Look around. Christmas and New Year's decorations are gone, mostly. The 12 days of Christmas have passed, and even Orthodox Easter was last Sunday. 344 days until Christmas. I think, it may be 345, I'm close. There are no more nativity scenes. And I bet 90% of you have taken your holiday decorations down. Oh, I see some no's. Well, we'll join you, we still have a few up. We've got lights around our front door. We've got a tree, that lighted tree that my mother made over the fireplace. My mother made it in 1958. And we have some of Margaret Ann's collection of Tomptons. If you want to know what those are, ask her. They're Swedish house elves. They're supposed to do nice things for you in the middle of the night. Eh, whether they do or not, we'll see. We've kept the lights up because it's January and it's dark. And we need light. I know I'm not alone. Last Sunday night, I was sitting with some friends, and a couple of them commented, quote, I'm tired. I feel a bit drained. I'm not sure what's next. This may be true for a lot of us. That's what post-Christmas blues look like. We're tired. We may even be a little spiritually dry. We used it all up. And the busyness of our schedules has returned and we can't avoid it. So we worry about the snow that's coming tomorrow. Duh. 
Yet despite my feelings, I was forced by the text today to try to focus on God's call to you and me. And let me tell you what I'm trying to do, and we'll listen for it. I'm trying to look at how do we listen for God's call even when we're preoccupied and tired because I think it's still coming. What do you think when you hear the word call? Do you think about the telephone ringing? Do you think about a friend's request? Do you think about a weather report? Snowbird? One story of call that I think about happened 45 years ago. I took my daughter, Anne, who was five then. You can guess what she'll be at the next birthday. And we were at Hundred Oak Shopping Center. Remember when it used to be a shopping center? And we were looking in the toy store for ideas for Santa or grandma and grandpas. And she was exploring. Well, Jack got preoccupied. I started looking at the games on a shelf as possible gifts for my brother, who's a great gamer, and he's never picked up a phone. He's still on the board games. During the search, evidently, my daughter, Anne, called me several times. Dad, come here. I was preoccupied. Dad, come here. She called Dad, and Dad didn't hear her. So she wanted to break me out of the trance. She wanted to show me what she had found. So at the top of her voice in the toy store, she shouted, Hey, Jack Lee, come here! <laughs> I didn't even know she knew it was Lee in the middle. <laughs> and you guess what I did? I immediately got out of my trance, and I went and talked to Ann, and we made a list of some things that I took to Grandma and Grandpa. Here's the connection. How do we listen for God's voice when we're preoccupied with ordinary times? While God sometimes shouts like Ann did, and my mother used to call me Jack Lee Seymour when she wanted me to get things done, but most of the time we don't hear those shouts, do we? Most of the time, God calls us quietly amid our tiredness and our ordinariness. In fact, I'm not 100% sure that many of us have dramatic calls. My guess is most dramatic calls are rare. That's not to say they don't happen. Well, let's see if we can make any sense of it. Let's look at the two lead characters from today. First, Philip, and then Dr. King. Philip, on the surface, the gospel reading doesn't help us very much. Jesus calls and Philip immediately responds. He then goes to Nathaniel, a man with no deceit, who's skeptical because nothing good can come out of Nazareth. And that's where Jesus came from. But when Nathaniel sees Jesus, Jesus says, Hey, you're a man with no deceit who's been studying a lot. Dramatic calls. Both Philip and Nathaniel are convinced. Yet, folks, if you look at Philip's story pretty carefully, it doesn't really help us very much. Guess what? Philip only appears once each in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I guess where that is? In a list of the disciples. Nothing big. Nothing magical, no great stories of Philip. And here in John, if you read the other stories about Philip, you're going to get yourself really in trouble because the first one sounds okay. He came from Bethsaida, where Simon Peter and Andrew came from. Guess what? He might have been a fisherman, and he might have joined Jesus because his buddies did. But then there are three more incidents in John, and we all go downhill. 
The 5,000 5, come for Jesus to feed them. And Jesus looks at Philip, and in panic, Philip says, Oh boy, it's going to cost a lot to feed this group. <laughs> and Philip doesn't help. Secondly, a group of Greeks come to Philip and say, Will you take us to see Jesus? And Philip is reluctant because he's not sure they're welcome. What? And then finally, when Jesus is teaching the disciples about recognizing God's presence, Philip absolutely doesn't understand. And here's a quote. Jesus says to him, Philip, don't you know me even after I've been with you all of this time? Well, he had a dramatic call. <laughs> Didn't do much good, did it, for a while. However, Philip may be a guide for you and me. Maybe we're the ones sometimes that misunderstand everything, and eventually it makes sense to us. Because evidently, eventually it made sense to Philip, because in early church history, Philip is known as an ambassador for the way of Jesus to the people in what's now Turkey. He became a major leader and supporter, even with all that goofing up that happened in the middle of it. Sound like you? Sound like me? Yep. Now, secondly, let's look at Dr. King and see what we can learn from Dr. King. Well, on the surface, everything looks dramatic, doesn't it? He made a profound impact. His call had to be clear. Well, guess what? Dr. King tells us it wasn't. Let me tell you a story. Dr. King wasn't certain he was called to congregational leadership. He didn't go to Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery thinking he was going to start a revolution. After seminary, you know what he did? He went to Boston University to do a doctorate in theology. Why? Because he wanted to teach, not preach. But in 1954, he was still working on his dissertation. He got a call from Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery. He probably took it because he had to pay for his school bills. <laughs> and he was still writing his dissertation. We've had a lot of students like that. While he got called from Dexter Avenue, the congregation was solid, but he was told, we need a lot of revitalizing. <laughs> and in addition to that, while the congregation stood for judge justice, most of the leaders in the church said, everything's really falling apart right now, we need somebody who will help us make sense of it. It wasn't a plum parish. In fact, Dr. King, when he was invited to preach for his call sermon at the church, said, quote, I've no pretense of being a great preacher <laughs> or a profound scholar. I come to you only with the claim that I'm a servant of Jesus and I feel dependent on God's grace for leadership. Wow, what a humble statement. And he did depend on God's grace. Within two years of going to Montgomery, he was elected to be chair of the Montgomery Improvement Association. And at a meeting of the Montgomery Improvement Association, guess what they did? They planned the Montgomery bus boycott. He didn't initiate it. Other people did. And Dr. King regularly said, quote, there's a lot of stuff I didn't plan. <laughs> it just so happened. The grace of God called me as I was listening to the regular events of everyday life, God called. Now, let's underline this with a true story about Dr. King. 
one you probably haven't heard. The year after the Montgomery bus boycott, he was offered a faculty teaching position at Garrett Theological Seminary, where Margaret Ann and I taught. After considering it for quite a while, a year, he finally wrote the president, and let me quote, I reluctantly decline your gracious offer. I say reluctantly because I'm not absolutely convinced that I'm doing the right thing. I've got the letter. He mentioned he was torn between teaching and preaching. And even with the successes that were happening in Montgomery, he said, quote, I'm not absolutely convinced. But then he prophetically ended the letter by writing, and let me read it to you. As you know, I'm deeply entrenched in the rising tide of racial conflict here in the Deep South. My congregations and members of the community are also involved. They look to me to guide them spiritually. Otherwise, as they move with uncertainty through this maze, and I move with uncertainty through this maze. I have a sense of responsibility at this point and feel that the next few years I need to stay here. My place is in the Deep South, and I need to do everything in my power to alleviate the tensions. I've started on this challenging venture of love and nonviolence that I'm not really sure what it means. <laughs> but I'm also too aware that the philosophy that's been spread throughout the Deep South needs to hear about love and nonviolence. I'm hoping that the grace of God will carry me through. I have to say no now even though I'm not sure I'm making the right choice <laughs> because I know I have, it'll take time and hard work here and I need to stay for a while. I may call you back. <laughs> it was in the midst of everyday living that a man we look back on as a hero was struggling to make sense of what really was his call. And those who were surrounding him were also uncertain about their call. So friends, when you and I are a bit down, <laughs> tired, not sure about our calls, think about Philip. He dramatically said, yes, Lord, and blew it. <laughs> and then he did it. Or think about Dr. King who said, I'm not certain. I'm doing the right thing, but I need to stay and try. You see, whether it's Philip, Dr. King, me, or you, God's call to us comes in the ordinary moments of life. Only in our daily lives, in the struggles that we have, do we hear God's call? And sometimes it's not very clear. But let me give you a couple examples. Look around this church. Think about your friends and the people who you know from this congregation. Let's think about call. You get a telephone call from a friend who says, my wife's in intensive care. He needs some company. What do you do? You respond. Or a friend living near you hurts her back. She says, I'm really hurting. And you volunteer to go shopping for her. You've heard a call. You see two friends in the congregation who gather the young children and teach them to be musicians leading worship. And what do you do? 
you praise them and say, anything I can do to help you? You've responded to a call. You see, the leaders of the church struggle to provide resources for unhoused persons. And you say, I'll join you. I'll stand with you as we try to figure out what's next. Congregations have calls too. Or you attend a symphony performance where a cross-cultural group of musicians perform an inclusive program where songs of Jewish musicians and African-American gospel singers are joined. We went to the symphony last Friday. <laughs> and you wonder, how can I work for inclusion? Because this is the most inclusive crowd we've seen in the symphony for a long time. Or you watch on television a celebration of Dr. King's Ministry of Justice. And you wonder where God wants you to be. And you hear about a service project. And you volunteer an hour. <laughs> You've heard a call. Or you see a country musician who you don't really listen to testify before Congress about the damage of drugs and you reach out to a really good friend of yours who you know is struggling with addiction. Friends, God's call comes in the everyday moments of your and my life when we're tired. And it doesn't matter whether you're Philip or Jack or Mary or Evelyn or Joe, or Susan, or Rick, or Rob, or Margaret, or Laura, or Dean. Could I go on? It doesn't matter. God's calling in the quiet moments of your life. And there are ways you can respond. <clears throat> Let me close this morning. One of the very best descriptions of God's call is reflected in an amazing poem, The Work of Christmas. I bet some of you have heard it. And you've sung it, I think. It's set to music, too. It was written by Dr. Howard Thurman, who in 1953 was named to be chaplain at Boston University, the first African American to have a role of chaplain in a white university. 53 long time ago and early in the struggle. He was known as a great scholar and mystic. Listen to his words. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are all home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, that's when the spirit of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among others, to make music in your heart. I promise you, I'm tired. <laughs> You're tired, but God's calling. Just look around. Wherever moments of healing, forgiving, gathering in, peace or community happen, we're being called to do the same. To heal, to gather in, to forgive, to build community. And friends, so we do. Amen. Thank you so much. Would you join me in singing hymn number 2137? Would I have answered when you called?
Friends, as we pray today, I'm going to do something called bidded prayer. I'm going to make a comment, and then I'm going to say, let us pray about. And I'd ask you silently or even aloud, if you feel like it, to respond with a prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, you call, and we're tired and preoccupied. You call, and we rush to get groceries before the storm. You call, and our ears perk up. You guide us. We look around, and we see what our friends are doing and what they need. Help us be present. Let us pray for those who need healing. Holy God, we thank you for your healing touch because we know it reaches us even when we're frightened and in pain. Pray for those who need forgiving. Holy God, it's so hard to forget I hold grudges. Help me to let go and move on. Pray for those who need peace. Holy God, when we look at our nation and we look at the world, we are so scared about the wars we see. Help us to continue to pray and work for peace. And pray for those who need community, who need people around them. Holy God, we were not meant to be alone we were meant to be in community. Help us to build together, to work together. Holy God, you call and we're tired and preoccupied. You call and we rush to get groceries before the storm. You call, but our ears do perk up. We know you'll guide us. Help us to see around us. Help us to be present and respond. And in the name of Jesus, we now pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples that has come down through history for us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's time for the offering with the... Here's the plates. <laughs> Friends, God's given you and me so much. This is the time for us to remember to give a few things back.
Let us pray. God of all wisdom, how often have we been deaf to your voice speaking to our hearts, especially when we move in a world that needs you so desperately. The reading from 1 Samuel brings us the phrase, the word of the Lord is hard to hear in these days, which resonates with the relevance of the evening news in our days. As we bring our gifts to be dedicated this morning, we pray that you might open our ears and open our hearts to hear where you call us to respond with obedience so that we might do what you need to be 
done in heal- toward healing our world. In Christ we pray. Amen. Before we dismiss, I want to make an announcement, a prayer announcement. Uh, Eddie Myers died on Friday. So let's remember to keep his family in our prayers. Uh, Arrangements for his service have not been made yet. So the church office will let you know about that. Your turn. You got it. Sorry. Thank <laughs> you.